Welcome to Scott Pilgrim versus the podcast, the podcast where we take down Scott Pilgrim. We got one last chance at this one final battle before it all goes down. We're going to be talking, of course, about volume six, Scott Pilgrim's finest hour. I'm Alex. I'm Pete. And uh, sadly, our third co-host, Justin, was defeated by Scott Pilgrim. Oh, man. You knew Stabbed it was going to happen. Stabbed through the mid <laughs> God Pilgrim stole his sword. He's done. it's it's rough when you get your own sword to pull out of you and then stabbed with it. You know what I mean? That yeah. hurts how, extra hard. Real quick, how many swords you got in there, Pete? Oh, too many to count. <laughs> oh man, I actually believe that. Well, listen, as we've indicated here, we're going to be talking about Volume Six of Brian Leo O'Malley's Scott Pilgrim. We're going to be revisiting it. It was originally published July 20th, 2010 by Oni Press. What a year. Don, what a beautiful year. What a (laughs) time to be alive. Uh, It kind of was. I I was having a good time in 2010. We had just uh, launched our show a couple of years back. We were in the prime. Our joints weren't aching. (laughs) We weren't creaking going up the stairs or anything. Anyway, Brian Lee O'Malley was feeling it a little bit because he had to uh, bring in some assistance. I believe this was for the last volume as well, but they're specifically credited here. John Kantz and Aaron and Chetta served as art assistants on the book. They helped a lot of fleshing out the backgrounds and adding different uh, flavors and characters and things like that. Because at this point, if I remember correctly, Brian was definitely feeling the crunch. People were like, when's the last volume? When's it coming out? Yeah, where's the last volume, where's where's the last volume bro? Yeah, you kind yeah, of built on, this up, like, on. what's up? And it didn't even really take that long to get it out, looking back at it now, but definitely at the time, everybody was champing at the bit to get the series, to finish it up, find out what's going on with Scott and Ramona. Now, if it has been a while since you read the book or you never read the book and you're listening to this podcast because you're excited about the Netflix series or something like that, here's the rundown. Scott and Ramona ostensibly have broken up. Ramona disappeared, presumably to go back to Gideon. We find out that's not exactly the case in this volume as Scott finally decides to final battle it up with Gideon Graves in the Chaos Theater, which has opened up in Toronto. He goes to fight him. And instead, we find out that Ramona has just been exactly where Wallace, I believe, says she was, which was in the wilderness for the past year, hanging out with her dad, but mostly dicking around, playing video games, watching the X-Files, and that's pretty much it. Find that out towards the end of the volume, but we do get this final battle in the Chaos Theater. We get a lot of closure for a lot of characters, including Envy Adams, who shows up here to play a gig. And ultimately, Scott and Ramona end up together. They do decide to try again at the end. Uh, Scott has started up a new band with Ramona, which is pretty bad. Uh, even Neil, who finally gets to call Neil and not oh, Neil has the greatest day of his life. Oh my god, such catharsis going on there. And Knives Chow don't really like it that much. So, what a bummer for them, but they're having fun. Uh, so I think what we're going to talk about here, what I would love to get from you, Pete, obviously, we'll break down specific moments throughout the book, but final volume thoughts and series thoughts. You know, obviously, I think we love it, but like, how do you feel? Looking back on it now, 13 years later, how did the series wrap up? Well, some uh, complicated feelings. First yeah. off, the the volume was was awesome. I loved it. Um, I feel like in this iteration of it, just the book, I feel like him and Ramona were the kind of uh, meant to be. You know, we were pulling for him and Kim, you mm-hmm. know, for a lot of it, for the ships. But he goes and visits Kim and gives it a try, which was very exciting. I was very uh, happy about that. He also tries again with knives, which was weird. But um, I think that it's a great ending, like the kind of like Holden Ham's jumping into the desert afterlife world together or Mm -hmm. into the sun or wherever they go uh is a beautiful kind of moment of like through their trials and tribulations the ups and downs they're gonna really kind of uh give it a go again which i think was very sweet and a very great ending i think the movie though kind of cleaned up the chaos theater battle in such a cool way mm. like um i, I think well, don't, some... don't jump ahead too much we're right, going to talk right, about right. the movie on the but overall episode. overall there was some really great moments i loved it i i felt like um 
you know, uh, uh, some parts. Uh, and, and I think that happens when uh, someone's working on something and then gets to do it again. You can, can, can some make some different choices, find some different things. But I was super impressed, especially like there's a lot of little things. Speaking of kind of like the, the stuff in the background, there was a lot of fun jokes mm -hmm. uh, for sure. And I think that uh, paid off in the book, especially so. Yeah, overall, I, I think it ends with a kind of a feel good kind of way. And uh, that makes me very happy. Yeah, it's interesting to hear you say you've gotten so back and forth, I think, volume by volume on this podcast in terms of who Scott needs to end up with. And I, I, yeah, I agree with you that versus the last volume that was showing how they shouldn't necessarily be together, this volume was showing how maybe they should but maybe they shouldn't and i think that's my big ultimate takeaway here is like we talked about i think from the very beginning the series is about growing up you know it's about even more so in this volume i i think about finding empathy for other people understanding that outside of your own precious little life there are other people with other feelings and they might be feeling the same thing as you sometimes but coming about it in a different way that comes to bear towards the end of the volume when you have this showdown with scott and gideon where scott says hey i I, I think I get you, man. I think I get the fact that you want to keep all of your ex-girlfriends on ice until they love you again. You don't want to move past this thing. I understand why you're doing that. And I think he gets, he, he levels up again. He levels up, yeah. He gets the understanding sword. And Scott's a Dumbo, you know, yes, the, yeah. the series is very open about that. Even Ramona is like, don't crowd his brain with too many thoughts. There's not a lot going on there. He's forget stuff. He shouldn't be hit more. But ultimately what it's about is like Scott leveling up and understanding, not getting total universal understanding of everybody else's experience, but being able to relate to somebody else rather than live inside his own head is, I, I would say, at least one of the ultimate morals of the book. And I really like how hard this hit that what were you gonna say you, well you just said something that kind of blew my mind like if he achieved universal understanding can you imagine how big that sword would be like that would be awesome <laughs> it would be an anime sword it would oh, be like man. a regular sword it would yeah, be, an anime it would be sword. pretty One cool those big ones you know yeah yeah about. Um, I'd call out a video game here but I literally have no reference for any sort of anime swords it's I I, I like that and I think I appreciated the ending more reading it through this time than I did originally because Agreed. there was so much pressure for this book to deliver and there was no way it was going to live up to those expectations back in 2010. Here, reading, well, it's not because you're going to pick it apart and you have your own picture of what's going to happen and it ends, particularly on the last couple of pages, in a very quiet way. Yeah, and I think it does a great job. I don't think like 2010 me was like, this is bullshit. No, you no, know? I don't think I was. it was bullshit. But I remember having my own expectations and having like, wow, this is a huge final battle. Does this feel like the rest of the volumes? Maybe, maybe not, because there's a lot of more like quirky slacker is probably the wrong word. But the first five volumes definitely have this sort of offhand quality to them that here you're getting like massive sword battles. Gideon grows yeah. to 30 feet tall, uh, Titan inside Ramona's head. So there's a lot of this bigger stuff going on that feels like a conclusion, but I don't know if it, when I originally read it, if I felt like it was totally consistent with the rest of the books, reading them in quick succession, I do. And I really like the ending here because I think now that I've been able to sit with that theme for almost a decade and a half, the idea of Ramona and Scott getting to a place where like, eh, we don't know if this is going to work out, but you know, we understand each other a little better now. Both of us, Ramona is not just going to run away. She's going to try something. She's going to try to stay and try something different. And Scott is going to try to understand her feelings and that her feelings are separate from his feelings in his own life. But this is jumping all the way to the end, but I wanted to throw this out to you because this is definitely like I was left with this very hard with this read through is you were talking about the last images. They jump into subspace and they're holding on to each other. And over the course of several pages, they get further and further away. And as they get further and further away from us, the reader, they get physically closer and closer. 
as their images start to join. And then ultimately we're left with a silhouette that's just a blot on the page, but it's one blot. It's not two separate blots. What do you take away from that? What's your interpretation of that? Well, see, Alex, how it works is the farther away you get from something, you mm -hmm. know, like they appear closer. They didn't oh, necessarily right. get become one being, you mm -hmm. know, like one little part. Oh, okay, so your takeaway is Brian Leomali is trying to explain to us how distance works. Exactly. If you get enough distance from something, just like a relationship, you start to kind of like, you know, kind of see and... and uh, no, I just think that... It's just a, a kind of a beautiful shot and also mm -hmm. to take the time to kind of like, um, you know, and all this action to kind of have that kind of, like you said, quiet, kind of beautiful sunset ending, uh, riding off into the sunset together in a different kind of anim anime cool way, I think is, is a cool, nice take, you know, it's a feel good kind of, uh, it gives you a little hope. Well, the thing that I think is interesting about it, and maybe this is totally the wrong interpretation, but I think you could almost look at it as the opposite of what he's saying throughout the book, that they are these separate people, but ultimately they're becoming one person visually by the end, they're joining together. Is that what a relationship is? Do you become one person? Do you become one being? Is the indicator that scott and ramona are going to try and ultimately they're successful because they join together in this beautiful white space um or is it just for the last time they're becoming comic book art like literally leaving us with hey this is a visual that's all they are so take away from it whatever you the reader want to take away from it because the book is so meta about video game stuff and comic yeah. book stuff and everything else yeah. so I don't know. I, I assume it's up to the reader. Interpret it however you want. Um, but I do. But, I think that's beautiful. Yeah. I think that is, you know, part of a relationship is you grow together and kind of become one thing. As someone who's been through a divorce, it does feel like you have to grow part of you again, like you lose mm -hmm. part of you and you have to kind of try to piece yourself back together. So it is, I mean, you know, achieving oneness is a very kind of, lofty goal and i think uh, in a relationship uh you know so I, I think that's very beautiful but i would say it wasn't really white space as much as it seemed yellowish you know what i mean like almost like a uh oh sure just because of the faded comic book pages because they're 13 years old now no no but that where <laughs> that desert is more of a yellow than a white i just think that you know oh like... you were reading the color version i keep forgetting about oh that. that's right yeah, yeah that is the uh, okay. sorry yeah yeah you're right i guess the so black it's yellow at the end yeah yeah whoa that okay so that that's actually i think really interesting because yeah it's funny how that kind of changed a little totally. bit of how you take it in yeah and even think about that but yeah mm. they it's a glowing yellow uh almost kind of like huh. a yeah yeah that is i my mind honestly legitimately is kind of blown right now because that is so different like i'm reading the original black and white volumes that yeah. i picked up 13 years ago and it is like the gray pages you know because they're newsprint ish right. um like they're thick manga pages but it's white space and black and that's all you got like yeah. it's just this black almost grayish blot but just because of the printing on the white page Having it be yellow, having it be the desert, which I assume is the same place that Scott goes after he dies, right? Like, is it the same coloring as that? Or... Well, that's the thing is now I just opened it back up because uh, that's my original thing. It was just like, oh, it's yellow like the desert place. But now kind of looking at it since we're talking right now, it's... Uh, it is a, a little bit of that color, but it's brighter and kind mm. of more. So huh. it's, yeah, yeah. It's almost, at first I thought it was like, it kind of looks like they're jumping into the sun. Interesting. Man, I don't know. I got to think about it. I don't, I don't <laughs> feel like, <laughs> I feel totally thrown by this. Just because this is part of the reason that I haven't read the color versions is because I feel like it changes things so much. It definitely We talked does. about like little jokes, like Ramona's hair being like, God, she's always changing her hair, but it's always in black and white. So it doesn't matter versus oh, wow. in the color books, she does. Like she oh, has yeah. all of these different looks. Oh. Okay, we got to move on from this, otherwise I'm going to spend too much time thinking about this. We're going to be like, hey, I was a podcast. They spent like 30 minutes talking about me. 
It is. It's a very different experience. And I think, you know, just to take it further, like we're going to be, like I said, talking about the movie. We're obviously going to be talking about the anime. I think all of the different ways it changes it, it changes the context and it changes the way you interpret these things. So, yeah. And I also now that you're thinking about that, because I originally read the black and white and now for the reread, I'm reading the color and it does have a different feel. It has a, a different vibe to it, so that's a it's, it's an interesting thing to kind of be comparing. And uh, but yeah, I'm excited to see how it keeps evolving because to me, every evolution of this, ha- there have been uh, better moments and also some interesting choices that kind of affect. So uh, it'll be kind of cool to see uh, what the show is going to uh, kind of change and and bring about for sure. Uh, just to get back to the volume a little bit, I yeah. one thing I had also forgotten, and I think this comes from high expectations for the final volume, is when I read it the first time, I was so focused on the plot. How is this going to turn out? What is going to happen to these characters? That going back and reading it this time, it's still very funny, like laughed out loud funny throughout the book. There are great jokes. A lot of the asides, there's two dudes who are in the background the entire time Gideon and Scott are fighting, and they keep yelling at Scott to be like, enough, stop yeah. it, move on, go ahead. There's the whole thing about, I, I think it's Ramona, and they're like, who is this chick? Look her up on Wikipedia. And they're like, oh, she died. I'm updating her Wikipedia page. All of these things that are happening on the side there made me laugh out loud. The whole thing about <laughs> Gideon the cat not being named after yeah. Gideon and Scott thinking like exactly yeah. what we talked about the last yeah. episode of the podcast. He was like, wait, you're not the cat? I thought you were the cat. What's going <laughs> on here? Time, yeah. That's great. Also, the shot in here of Gideon the cat, I think it's in this volume of Gideon the cat coming back and Scott hugging yeah. it, where the cat yeah. is just like eyes open, being like, let me be. <laughs> yeah. Did you, as a cat daddy yourself, did you uh, identify with that scene? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, cats hate it when you pick them up and uh, show any kind of affection, <laughs> uh, unless they want to show you affection, then, you know, but uh, yeah, well, yeah, that was a perfect perfect kind of uh, cat face for sure I yeah while we're talking about little background moments if I could the the part where you think Scott dies and then the sisters like sorry mom false alarm yeah I told you you got a level up in volume three mm-hmm. and in the movie there's this fun bit of like this one character being like yeah the movie is better than the book you know where they're just uh, having Mm -hmm. these fun references and just kind of like really having a blast it is uh, just to jump on that for a second so we get like i said at the beginning some wonderful moments of catharsis here for a lot of characters particularly obviously scott and ramona envy adams gets a wonderful arc over the oh my god yeah the the closure hug was amazing Mm -hmm. That's great. But also just for her being like, nope, I'm a solo artist. This is what I want to do. I'm going to finally yep. own myself and be myself rather than having all of these other people define me. It, it's funny. It's almost the opposite of Scott's arc in a certain way because she's always been defined by how other people see her, but now she's becoming herself. But there's also a great emotional moment there where she turns to Scott and she's like, you never really bothered to know me. You, 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 you're just seeing me who, for who I am. Yeah. So I I love that. Young Neil gets that beautiful moment where Scott's like, this is young, this is Neil. And yeah. just, he starts crying. He's, he's glowing. Like, yeah. He's glowing. It's great. There's a little bit of a sense of maybe he's going to have something going on with Scott's sister, Stacy, um, which I think is very cute if we were to ever follow that forward. And then uh, there's a great moment with uh, Stephen Stills where we find out Dude with Beard and him have been dating since volume five, uh-huh. but Scott Adorable. was busy. But and that's then very... Scott ruins that kind of sweet moment, of course. It was... mm-hmm. I did. Uh, just to talk about this for a second, I do want to get back to my main point, but I did like this little moment of course correction, it felt like, like moving forward course correction in terms of, we've talked a little bit about how some things didn't age well throughout the book, yeah, the use definitely. of the R word, not great. Um, I think the fact that like Scott is super, yeah, lesbians, let's go, feels a little late 2000s, probably wouldn't hit it in the same way. And by the time we're getting to this, 
the fact that he reacts the same way to Steven and his boyfriend that he reacted to Ramona and her ex-girlfriend felt to me like, okay, that's course correction there. We're not being skeevy about this stuff. Instead, this is just how Scott reacts to these things. Did, did you have the same feeling or do you not feel that way? Well, I just feel like uh, Scott's, you know, he's got a lot to learn and grow, uh, you know, and he's getting there one bit at a time. Mm -hmm. So the fact that like, you know, um, he is trying is a huge thing, you know, he's got, yeah. And that Envy kind of pointed out, she was just like, dude, you, you've got to become a human being, man. You know, like it's, uh, get to know people and, you know, but uh, yeah, I do think that, um, it was a sweet kind of uh, moment for Scott to kind of see them and be kind of like, oh, my God, this is, you know, so that was cool. Yeah. Uh, my main point, though, instead of just running through every single character is, do you think overall this did right by all of the characters? Like, do you feel that there was anybody left to the side, left to the background? What's your take on that? I mean, that's hard to say because this was kind of made in a time capsule back in the day so there is a little bit of stuff that doesn't translate as well so that's why i'm a little kind of uh but i do think you know all acknowledging all of that i think the kind of main theme of the books overall very much so where we did get to spend a little time with each one of the characters and scott kind of being like you know it was a dumb joke of kind of casual sex, uh, you know what I mean? Which wasn't what we really kind of wanted for Scott, but he did kind of like get some closure with certain things and kind of find out like, oh, okay, I think I belong with Ramona and that's why it felt good, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think what I was kind of getting at is in particular Kim Pine and maybe Knives Chow to a certain uh, respect are a little bit sidelined in this book. Like I think Knives gets a little more closure in terms of she literally is like, I've just moved on, which yeah. doesn't track necessarily with what happened in the previous volume. Like there's been a lot of back and forth with Knives. In but I also think character. like, yeah, you know, we don't see the moment where she got to kind of be like, ah, I'm over Scott. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? It could have been a simple thing or, you know, more complicated than that. But yeah, that it does happen. You know, I mean, I think so. the implication, she says, she's like, I'm 18 now. And I think the implication with Knives as a character is she just is very much the youngest person possible going through all of these emotional catharsis in the biggest, quickest way possible, which is something you do in your teen years. You're like, you know, in a basic way, you're like, I love trading card games now. And a week later, you're like, I do not like trading card games at all. And with knives, it's I love Scott. And then she turns 18. And she's like, I'm older now. It is time to move on to other yeah. things. And I, I think that's what's going on there. But again, I want to see more because we spent time with her more. Yeah. Yeah, but I do think that, you know, it's a big part of growing up is trying on different things, seeing what feels good, what works, what doesn't. And yeah, so, yeah, and I was. This is you're talking happy. about the period where I wore vests for a while, right? As yeah, a yeah. I was like, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah you really it, got it into vests. I did, uh, actually. <laughs> hey, man, you know, there, there's something for everybody. Um, but I think that that's why I got really excited when Scott kind of like ended up to go visit Kim. And I was like, this is it yes this is what i've been waiting for they're load together in a secluded location let's go and then i was like oh my god this is so not the what i wanted it to be but i also like the kind of choice that they made even though i was a little heartbroken um it made sense for what everything that was going on so i appreciated the fact that we got the, that kind of time with them I also like the time with them. However, I would say I did feel a little creak in the story there at that point, because like we talked about, it really felt like, particularly with the last volume, well, this is leading up to Kim. Alex, if you have an older book, sometimes they creak, you know, mm. if you're reading them, you know, it's oh, just because you got to oil them, right? Yeah. You got to well, pour oil. Uh, no, I do that regularly. I go in and I oil my comics. Get them oh, real nice and no. slick. Oh, God. <laughs> olive oil right that's the oh thing you use God. and then oh you fry them up real nice and you cut them with a knife and a fork it, i guess i'm too old as soon as you said olive oil i merely thought of popeye mm. um 
No, not that. The actual yeah. cooking material. The uh, the thing that I was saying, though, is it felt like... So we get to see Scott, and I do want to get back to the casual... Actually, let me just mention the casual sex thing. I didn't love that running No, joke. it was awful. It didn't... I think yeah. the thing that doesn't work about it, even though there's some funny payoffs... like They're the trying scene, to be cute about it. He's trying to be like, casual sex? But yeah, yeah, but it's... This is going to sound very prudish, and I don't mean it that way. I think it's the use of the word sex in context, because the way they haven't really used that throughout. They've talked about making out. There's sort of this pure innocence, even about, like, we know Scott and Marona have sex. We know several other characters have sex. Wallace is talking about it all the time. But scott is this pure innocent character and clearly he doesn't understand what casual sex means and he doesn't want to have it even though he probably has had it a bunch of times in the past but saying it out loud using that word it feels a little too blunt you know yeah like, it's, the there is a cringe factor or just kind of like oh this doesn't fit a little bit mm -hmm. but it kind of goes with this theme of people you know trying things and yeah Dude. so I totally and it, it does, does have a good... pull it pulls you out a little bit yes. of what's going on uh for sure it feels a little off from what we've been doing this whole time but mm -hmm. um it does seem like a stupid thing that scott would do and so just to talk through it in order the the first person he does it with, with is knives right right and that's that both is horrible and then works as a punchline, I think, because you have them making out and you're like, oh, this is icky. It is mm -hmm. not okay just because she's 18 now. But then to have the punchline be it feels terrible and you also feel terrible works because yeah. it, it pays off that moment, even though it's a bad thing that should absolutely should not happen. Yeah. But the thing with Kim that I was kind of getting at is he does the same thing with Kim. He tries to make out with her. There's a little, clearly a spark there, but she, and she's like, no, we've moved on. We've grown on it. It's a nice, sweet scene that we get with Scott and Pim that wraps up their storyline. I think Kim is the one that we get ghostly in the background, sort of like doing the Lion King thing. Yeah. The final battle, which I thought was fun. But I, I don't know. I don't know what we're supposed to take away from the Kim of it all. Because in the last volume, it seemed pretty clear that like Kim and Scott are most appropriate for each other. They should be together. Kim moves back home with her parents. That is nothing against anybody but like that is the opposite of growing up so for her to be the voice adult voice well of reason, alex you know sometimes things happen in life and you know I you know. need a little time to maybe I save them some money not point, i said know, figure some things out any... you know what i mean so like let's not <laughs> not point to get any figures to anybody particular you know, on this I mean, podcast on. or otherwise i i'm at my brothers okay there's a big difference totally Brothers are like little parents. Oh my God, you're an asshole. I I was not even bringing that up. I'm legitimately just talking about the book. I'm just uh, I'm just saying maybe there's people at home listening right now. Who are like, hey, fuck you, man. I'm doing my best out here. Rent's crazy expensive. I just lost my job. I got to save up some money. Again, not pointing any fingers at anybody. I very well, don't say <laughs> stupid stuff is my point. All I'm talking about is in the themes of the book and Kim Pine in particular is I'm just not quite sure what we're supposed to take away. There's nothing wrong with Kim, you know, going home for a little bit until she can figure out her next move is my point. Yes. And she obviously is on her own journey and doing her own thing. But as the character who seems like the most mature one of the book at certain points, I want to know a little more about what's going on with her, you know? Oh, that, yeah. That's I mean, I would love, you know, more on all the characters. but Absolutely. You know. So that's all. But to me, it felt like a plot move to finish things up with Kim, get her out of the way, be like, no, Kim and Scott are not endgame so that yeah. we can move on the bulk of the volume being about, no, Scott and Ramona are they're the ones that are going to get together. They're the ones that are going to fight for each other. Well, that's the where the the big confrontation yes. is. You know what I mean? Because like, how would it, how would it really go? Because I was thinking to myself, because I went through this whole thing of like, yes, this is the real ship. This is where, and I thought about it like, what happens? He goes to visit, and then he Kim's like, yeah, you know, I'm thinking about staying around here. And then Scott's like, great, I'll stay with you. <laughs> and then they jump and hold hands together. They disappear in the light that would be not the ending that 
and you you know, really we got to have them go to chaos mm-hmm. theater it's got to be this whole thing you know totally there's i don't want to rewrite scott pilgrim's finest hour or anything like that i think there are ways to do it and you not to jump ahead but you've talked about it with the different endings of the movie there's different yeah. ways that scott can end up in different people kim shows up to help him out she oh that would have been Potentially, like that's yeah. one way. There could also be like he solves the problem with Ramona. They slice Gideon into a million pieces. They get all the coins, and then he's like, "You know what? I think we've resolved this, but we both need to grow and change as people." Goes back to be with Kim or Kim. Yeah, uses that coin. To My go point visit being, him. like the, again, this is not to rewrite the book. It's just there are possibilities there in ways they can go, but there's a clear decision to be like it's not knives. It's not Kim, Kim. it's Ramona. It's all about Ramona. And to that point, to get back to what you said originally, way back at the beginning of the podcast, this does a great job of convincing you of this romance and why it could work over the course of the volume. The reveal of Ramona coming as soon as he dies, the one-up finally coming to bear. And the final fight, I love them working together and being together Uh to beat Gideon. Because that's ultimately the point is like they are moving beyond him together as a relationship, which I really liked. Then what's nice and, you know, again, I've mentioned this before, but that's what I loved about the Knives version of the movie I saw is Scott has this realization of like, I'm chasing something that I want that is shiny and new and exciting. But right next to me, I have this person who I love spending time with. I love playing video games with, and we are great together. And they fought together and won together. And that's why I love that version of it, because he's like, you know, uh, uh, sometimes, you know, you you have what you want if you can really kind of look at it and look what you what you're doing and what's important to you. So that's why I thought it worked in that version. But I was really moved by this and how the Ramona and Scott of it all really kind of came together. And I loved her badass moment of kind of breaking the chains and then kind mm-hmm. of like fucking shit up. It was really cool to see them work together. That slide kill move was really fantastic. Um, yeah, that's why you get excited about them jumping off in the light together because they kind of really earned it and are going to hopefully work together for their relationship, you know? Here's one thing that doesn't work for me in the volume, and I'm curious to hear if you feel the same, is the explanation of the glow. And yeah. the reason it doesn't work for me is it's too complicated. Everything else in it's Scott simple. Pilgrim it's yes it's very simple it's very straightforward there's an analog for something in a video game if it is a complicated concept so you get it but ultimately it's about the characters and the explanation of like i've read it several times and i still don't quite understand what's going on here in terms of gideon was a businessman that created this glow that sends people into subspace between their brains and he wants to monitor it, it's a lot of manipulate stuff manipulate them yeah. yeah yeah it's a lot and that's why i liked in the movie it was a chip she got chipped and is controlled by him and she doesn't he's not movie, aware man. Uh, is I feel like a, we're going to lose against this movie, too. I feel like you're tipping your hand a little bit here. Well, yeah, I just think it's a cleaner explanation. Also, the fight sequence in the movie is also cleaner. And the Nega Scott fight is kind of hilarious in, mm-hmm. in the movie as well. So I think it was just a kind of cleaner choice. And it's clearly someone who's created something, then worked on it, walked away and came back and was like, oh, I thought of another way that I can do this that kind of moves things forward, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, like I said, I think just it's, it's uh, this hiccup in the middle of the book. It feels like, Ooh, we got to explain this glow when mm-hmm. the simplest thing is it's just drawing her back to Gideon or she's thinking about Gideon, you know, which seems to be the implication but- over most of the volumes, but that's not what we get here. But what's great about this version, I love the fact that he gets amped up and then jumps in her purse. Mm -hmm. And then we see Gideon as this giant monster and he does this amazing headbutt move. And, you know, for that, even though it's a little kind of messy to get to that, that is such a cool and you can't it's harder to do in the movies creating these different worlds and mm-hmm. and having the well facts to i, I was going to say i was going to disagree with you a little bit in terms of i think 
I think the fight scenes build really nicely over the course of this book. We get sad Scott Pilgrim for the first quarter or so, and we yeah. get a couple of pages to wrap up at the end. But the bulk of the book is this fight at the Chaos Theater and going from the one-on-one -on -one of Gideon versus Scott, Scott dying, coming back, going in the purse, like you said, to this dream world, the subspace inside Ramona's head where he fights the gigantic Gideon. And I was like, how do you top that? How do you top a gigantic... Uh, Dragon Ball Z style Gideon, you come out and you have this huge fight where he's trying to bring envy into the fight. You've got frozen ex-girlfriends. All of this stuff is blowing out. Uh, and ultimately having Ramona and Scott fight him together, I thought was great. That really actually did work for me personally. I agree. I also <laughs> really love the moment of like after the headbutt, he catches Ramona mm -hmm. and then immediately is cut in half. I I just love the sequence of that. Mm -hmm. Such a fun roller coaster of emotions there. Yeah. I also like I, you know, said earlier, I love the kind of like nega uh, Scott in the in the in the movie, because like, you know, if there is an evil version of yourself, I love the fact that because they are the same person, it's super easy for them to get on the same page and want to hang out. And I thought that would be that's such a funny joke. Yeah. But the the fight in the book is also this kind of weird, funny kind of Scott Pilgrim -y thing where it's kind of like, oh, of course, he's got to now fight this kind of other version of himself. it it felt honestly like a little shoved into me like uh -huh. you wanted to make the nega scott i think it's sort of the same as dark link or i'm forgetting exactly what the character is called the legends of zelda there's a lot of zelda stuff in this volume down to the triforce shirt that he gets oh yeah after he spills his drink um I mean, uh, who doesn't love Zelda? You know what I mean? Like, you can't get enough Zelda references. Yeah. By the way, love the nice shirt joke that's running. <laughs> that yes. pays off so nicely. Several, it's two other people being like, nice shirt, sarcastically. And then Gideon Grace being like, let me be the first to say, nice shirt. And yeah. It's like, you're like the third person to say that. Very funny, very offhand joke in the middle of this very tense moment. Um, one other thing, I, I feel like I'm slamming this a lot and I don't mean to. I also don't love the amount of blood in this huh. volume, you know, like the rest of them, maybe similar to the casual sex thing. The fights are clean. Like, you yeah, know, he doesn't no blood. Yeah, he doesn't murder anybody. They just burst into coins. Even when he gets beaten up, it's like cartoon bruises. Maybe it's to emphasize the seriousness of this fight with Gideon, but having him being stabbed and actually seeing blood come out, him getting sliced repeatedly with a sword, these aren't cartoon swords or anime swords. It feels like they're fighting with real swords. Um and again, maybe the point is to uh, amp up the realism of what's going on in this volume. That's the point, yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. It, it took me out of it a little bit. Well, I also think it's this <clears throat> interesting idea of as Scott is getting older and growing as a person, he's becoming closer to the real world. And it's kind of like this mm. meeting of this fantasy world that he lives in and the reality of life. And like the closer he gets to evolving that's where the blood comes in and kind of so but yeah i agree with what you're saying it is kind of it, it is like well uh, you know yeah. well of, and also i mean as you age that's what happens right as more blood starts to come out and then everybody uh, has a limited amount of blood in their body and when you lose all the blood that's when you die nope that's right? not how life works buddy Sorry. that's what my doctor told me i, I don't I, know i don't know man. i don't know is are you is your doctor dr mario because i don't know where you're getting your advice but <laughs> yeah he keeps that's feeding me doctor. these pills and like <laughs> take them like turning them around anyway uh <laughs> any other notes for the book you want to talk about any other things that jumped out to you Oh my God! Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, oh yeah. Uh, while you're while you're looking through notes, I'll yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm no, no, that's oh, that's what notes. I want to say. I'll mention Julie Powers as a character who is very fun. That I would have wanted a little more closure for her as well. Like she felt like sort of shoved to the side for a funny joke with she is the original and then you have the two girls who just show up randomly throughout the volumes who are always commenting on stuff so she, she just feels kind of there i didn't really get much from her but she's a fun character regardless 
What were you going to say? The kind of like uh, Game Boy uh, memory cam running bit was just mm. such a cool uh, visual thing that kind of really gave me flashbacks to the old Game Boy days. Well, and uh, I th actually think that's actually uh, an important thing. Like we see that twice with Scott where he remembers things better than they actually were. And then once with Gideon, where same, where it is all about you you know and about your memories and how you remember the world it's always from your perspective it's always from your direction i think there's a line when he's first playing a game boy towards the beginning of the volume where he's like leave me alone i have to go save this tiny world or yeah. something like that yeah and that's what this book and series is all about right <laughs> like exactly. that, that's the point is like you have your own tiny world that you live in and understanding that there is perhaps more to your world that than that, that it goes beyond the bounds of a game. Maybe that gets back to what we're talking about with the final moment is they're jumping out of the game. They're leaving the game. That is the end of it. Is they're going into the real world, going into something more realistic than what they've been playing all the time now that they beat the final boss. I don't know. Just a thought. Yeah, I also like... So there's an interesting choice they make in the movie where instead of Scott being like logically not good in a band or, or a good musician, where in the movie they're all great and it's, I don't know, it amps it up and makes it more fun. I mean, the choice of Envy Adams playing at the Chaos Theater instead of like Scott's band is uh, kind of better because we have this Envy evolution, which I think really is nicely paid off. evolution, if you will. Ooh, but I do think that um, seeing Scott suck, you know, and seeing like Shatter Band blow is it's kind of heartbreaking in a way mm -hmm. that I think what's great about the movie is like, you know, you can kind of be a failure, a lot of life, but like be good at something and how it can kind of lift you up when you find your thing, you know, um, I'm going to so disagree with you. I mean, save some of this for the next episode. Sure, sure. About the movie. But I mean, this is the last volume that yeah, sure. basically is really based on the on the movie. So you got to kind of Yeah, the movie is based on it, actually. It came after. Well, right. But uh, yes. my... I know what you're I'm, saying. I'm just being I, mean. I like that, though. I think I mentioned this a couple of episodes back. I love the fact that they're just okay as bands. I feel like you don't see that a lot in any You never, yeah. They're either the absolute worst or the absolute best with nowhere in between. And, and the fact the, that it's so much more, choice, you know? Yeah, well, I love it. It's like so much more realistic, though, for them to be like, yeah, we're all right. We're not great. Like at the end, they end up playing I'm a Believer by the Monkees, and it's very clear. And you're like, that's exactly what would happen. <laughs> You'd try to write a song, and you're like, oops, it's another song. There's too many layers to that, though, because it's like the Monkees is this fake you know version mm -hmm. of a and then oh my god i'm a believer is like the, there's a lot of layers to that and it's a little little too it's close it's the uh, mille feuille of jokes right Pete? <laughs> <laughs> oh, any other boy. notes for the book that you want to call out here pete before we start to wrap up a, a great back matter uh the the back matter evolution as the books have gone on has been really awesome to kind of reread and revisit i'm a sucker for that kind of stuff yeah uh i gotta check out these color versions because i'm really thrown by now and also i didn't see any of that back matter because it's not present there's none of it in the original black and white volumes but there you go this was a close one i gotta say <laughs> uh, but I, i'm gonna call it for scott pilgrim i think yeah. we lost once again <laughs> us versus the series but we got a bonus round coming up baby we're gonna talk about the movie in full actually I'm which excited. version uh, ooh, maybe both, both versions. Maybe we should try to find so. the original ending, see if it's online somewhere as well. I don't know. There's got to be deleted scenes and bonus scenes. So we'll check it out. We'll be talking about that on the next episode. We'll also see if Justin gets a one up and is able to come. Yeah, back come it. on. But in the meantime, if you'd like to support this podcast and all the podcasts, we do patreon.com slash comic book club. Also, we do a live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. to Facebook and YouTube. Come hang out. We would love to chat with you about Scott Pilgrim. Apple, Spotify, Android, or the app of your choice to subscribe, listen, and follow the show at Comic Book Live on Twitter slash X, Comic Book Club Live on TikTok and Instagram, comicbookclublive.com for this podcast and more. And next episode, 
Scott Pilgrim, you're going down. Woo!